up to this point, the revolutions of this unit have been political. Now, the other big revolution was more economic. At least it has its roots in economics, but it certainly will filter out into the political realm as well as society. And that would be the Industrial Revolution. And you can see kind of the trajectory that the Industrial Revolution took in terms of where it began and where it spread out to. Now, it goes without saying, the Industrial Revolution began in Europe, specifically Great Britain, which we'll explore momentarily. But for decades, scholars have debated why Europe took the lead in facilitating the Industrial Revolution of the late 17 and early 1800s. Now, the conventional thought was that Europeans naturally had a restless and creative spirit that lent itself to innovation. And this view has been challenged because, you know, at different points in history, other areas of the world have taken the lead in technological innovation. You know, India, China, and the Islamic world enjoyed periods of innovation and were viewed favorable. You know, factors like life expectancy and living standards were no different in Europe than in many parts of the Asian world. And industrialization eventually took root in other parts of the world over a 250-year period of time. So these were some of the more traditional arguments. Now, one factor when we at least take a look at why Europe took the lead was that lack of unity following the collapse of the Roman Empire. So we, we go back to Rome yet again. Small and competitive European states began to take shape in the 12th and 13th centuries. And, and this jockeying for power contributed to the one-upsmanship of preventing economic and technological stagnation. This might explain why large compact empires like in China or the Mughal or Ottoman empires didn't really innovate as much. They already were one political entity. They didn't necessarily see the need to innovate. So when, when we look at why Europe, there is the idea of competition. Now, an additional factor is that since these European states were relatively new, they didn't have an administrative bureaucratic tax collecting class like, like we see in other empires. Therefore, European royals allied themselves with the merchant class and would offer privileges, monopolies, or tax collecting responsibilities to merchants in exchange for loans or payments to the state. This meant that it was in the interest of European states to encourage uh, commerce and innovation. European merchants gained a high degree of freedom, and in places like Venice and Holland, merchants actually ran the government. States would sponsor scientific societies, and they would grant charters and monopolies to private trading companies to the point that by the 1800s, Europe was on the way towards capitalism because support of private commerce was just seen as accepted practice. And due to their desire to find trade routes to Asia and the subsequent colonialism that followed, Europe was at the center of one of the largest and most varied networks of exchange in history. Their contact with diverse peoples was another factor that fostered change and innovation. While getting their hands on well-made Asian goods, such as Indian textiles and Chinese porcelain, led to imitators and the desire to innovate the industry. The Americas will also provide Europe with a market for their goods so they can economically benefit. So this really explains why Europe was at the forefront of this industrial revolution. But as you can see on the map, the cradle of the industrial revolution is a set of islands that are outside of continental Europe in the North Atlantic. So why was Great Britain at the center of this all? How was it that this tiny island took the lead in innovation? Now, England's path towards industrialization begins with agriculture. England implemented many agricultural innovations that helped increase yields with fewer workers. An innovator named Jethro Tull invented the seed drill to increase productivity. You know, manure was used as fertilizer more often. 
plows became lighter and animals were selectively bred. So with agricultural innovation, you can get more food with less workers. So now you have a labor surplus. You're gonna need something for them to do. Now, although the revolution centered on Britain, it, it wasn't planned and it was very spontaneous. So again, you couldn't have predicted that the rainy Northern Island Kingdom would become a world power. But over time, England's advantages would become clear. Now with their ample colonies, you know, possessing a variety of colonies in North America and the Caribbean and India, will provide access to the American windfall of food, profits, and calories. The trade and commerce between England and their empire will enjoy the protection of the Royal Navy, so goods and transportation are safe. Importantly, England, um, Great Britain had a commercial society where landowners had pushed small tenant farmers out in favor of enclosed fields for livestock. And urban merchants thrived because guilds had long since disappeared and it freed businessmen to run their enterprises as they saw fit. So aristocrats in Great Britain will engage in money-making entrepreneurial enterprises. And this is in contrast to the French and Spanish nobility who loathed the merchant culture. The population was growing rapidly and it provided a source of industrial workers that really had little else available to them. Now, on top of all of this, the British were religiously tolerant and they welcomed many refugees to, uh, I should say, from the continent. And that would be from the European continent. They enjoyed a stable political system and the rule of law as established by legal precedents. In this political environment, owners of capital were more willing to take risks. So they innovated with agriculture. England will take advantage of their imperial power, the way society is set up, and the political security that affords business. Unlike their colleagues on the European continent, British scholars engaged in practical observation of the world. They were practical as opposed to theoretical. This meant that their scientific institutions were much more in tune with the needs of engineers. Most innovators were actually artisans or craftsmen, but they were always in contact with scientists and entrepreneurs. On the European continent, these groups were separate. The British Royal Society was established in 1660, and it was designed to promote useful knowledge. The society sponsored public lectures and demonstrations. They published pamphlets on the latest scientific advances, and they established what were called mechanic libraries, and they were on the cutting edge of combining science and technology. And although they suffered from famously gloomy and wet weather, some of the geography did work to their advantage. You know, water in the form of the rain, the rivers, canals, and seaports provided a natural transportation infrastructure. Furthermore, on the British Isles, plentiful supplies of coal and iron, and iron were very near each other, and it was pretty simple to get them to these harbors and these markets. Britain's isolation as an island freed it from the political instability and the military campaigns of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era. So even though Europe is the center of this industrial revolution, it has its roots directly in Great Britain and with good reason.